When they came out with the Edsel a long time ago, I happened to be the automotive editor for a radio station in Detroit. Take it from me, that was real excitement when that thing came out. But as you well know, it turned out to be a disaster. There's always a flip side, isn't there? Because now, many years later, it's turned out to be something very valuable, and as Craig Worth says, it's worth watching. Ladies. And gentlemen. The new features of the beautiful new Thirty years ago, the first Etzels were rolling off the line. In a few weeks, they would be in the showrooms. There never was a car like it before. The ultimate dream car was here. How does it feel to own an Etzel? It's like falling in love. There soon would be a divorce. Sales bombed, dealers closed, jokes started about horse collars on the front of cars. All the more reason to collect them today. And that's why these people are here, to celebrate the car that cost Ford $350 million in losses. To celebrate the Etzel division that sold but 111,000 cars in three years. To celebrate a wonderful American underdog that's risen from the junkyard and into the heart. I like a convertible. I, I guess I still feel kind of young at heart. Oh, your step is snappy. When you own an Etzel. The honored spot of the celebration goes to this man, Roy Brown. He was the chief designer of the Etzel. Nineteen other cars on the road, all of them with horizontal front ends. So we decided the most unique thing was to get something, a combination of something so old that it was new, such as a vertical radiator. Actually, much of the design was way ahead of its time. The backlights were put up high for safety, just like the backlights of today. I was proud, absolutely proud. We did what we started out to do, which was to create a car that was different than anything else on the road. And we did it. The Etzo was partially murdered by timing in the recession of 58. Its marketing campaign wasn't a huge success either, although it's famous. Gail Warnick was the Etzo PR director. This is the way you sit in the Etzo. Contour seat made for three. He later masterminded the brilliant Mercury Cougar campaign but no one talks about that, just the Etzel. The whole idea was to give the public the impression that this was something brand, brand new. Getting low on gas, you can tell in the Etzel when the light goes on. I loved it. I loved that car. I was like everybody that stood up and applauded when they first saw it. After just five weeks into this, the 1960 model year, the Etzel was finished. The great car of the decade was dead for a while. And I said at the time, when it was going down the tube, I said, listen to me, that car is going to be a collector's car someday, and it's nice to be right. <laughs> well, it started as the American dream. It just took the country 30 years to wake up and realize that the Etzo is a great car. Craigworth, Channel 2 News. The Ford Motor Company built it, so you know it's good. <laughs> Ford's doing all right these days, isn't it? So there is a happy ending after all. Mr. Brown and Mr. Warnick went on to successful Ford projects, and the Edsel... A good one, nowadays, sells for many, many times its original cost. It's so he turned out to be right, the designer, yeah. huh? Very interesting. So if you keep something long enough, it's always <laughs> it's more always valuable. valuable. Yeah. Our first guest tonight is Roy Brown. Uh, like I said, he designed the Etzel and he's the father of the car, and he's brought some, uh, I think, interesting slides here to show us tonight. Uh, would you please welcome Roy Brown. Hi. I know it's an enthusiastic audience, <laughs> which is always good to have when you're talking about an Edsel. I, uh, I want to tell you how much I appreciate your invitation for my wife and I to come down here. Where is she? Where'd she go? Oh, there she is. My wife, Jeannie. <clears throat> and uh, when I think about the fact that I'm talking about something that took place 30 years ago, there's some of you weren't even born. And most of you were young kids. But I hope you enjoy it. I brought with me a series of slides which we just put into this projector. Jim Cook here 
helped me a lot. And uh, I spent a very interesting lunch with Jim and with Perry and uh, learned a lot about who owns the most Edsels in this country anyways. <clears throat> I have a Pacer convertible, in real nice shape, that is not for sale to anybody, but I may trade it for a better one sometime. <laughs> so without further ado, what I'm going to try and tell you is uh, what happened when we were designing the car. Maybe before I, I do that, I'd like to give you a little personal history. I don't know whether it was in any of the magazines you had about my background, just to show you where I came from. I came from Canada originally, Hamilton, hey. Ontario. That's all right, eh? <laughs> okay. Um, I've lived in Michigan since I was 15. I now live in Michigan, about 70 miles from Detroit, out in a very pretty part of the country on a lake out there. I retired in 1975, and since then I went back to my first love, which was art, and I now teach painting and drawing and sell a lot of paintings, as many as I can. I also am a frustrated architect, so I work for some local builders designing homes and things. And so I'm very, very busy. My car is not driven as often as it should be, and it doesn't look as good as it should, but that's because I'm busy. Anyways, I came to Detroit when I was 15. I should say my dad did, who was an engineer with Chrysler. I uh, went to art school in Detroit and joined General Motors as a car designer when I was 19, 1937, uh, I think it was. And uh, I helped design the 1940 Cadillac. I don't know whether if you, any of you know the, the, uh, the Cadillac of that time. And then I left there and went with a friend of mine who was an industrial designer. Now, an industrial designer is the same thing as a car. A car designer is an industrial designer. Anybody that designs anything for industry is an industrial designer, whether it's refrigerators, helicopters, or matchboxes, or anything. And uh, so I, I left General Motors and went into the industrial design field. But my real love was automobiles. So I finally called a good friend of mine, Gene Bordenay, who was then a key designer at Ford Motor Company, and said, hey, are you looking for designers with experience? He said, yeah, come on over, Roy. So I went over and I got a job there as a, they call it a senior designer in the Lincoln studio, working for a man called Bill Schmidt, who later became a vice president of Packard as a designer. And during that period of time, I was trying to prove myself at Ford that I knew what I was talking about, that I could design cars. And Bill gave me the chance to supervise and do the finalization on design on a car, that a Lincoln car, show car, called the Futura. The Futura, after it had served its purpose, was then sold and went to Hollywood to uh, the uh, workshop of a man by the name of, uh, I think it's Barry, is that? George the? Barris. Barris, George Barris, yeah. And he turned it into the Batmobile. And the, now, I have been credited as designing the Batmobile. That is not true. The concept of the car really was Bill Schmidt's, and it was my job to finalize it. I contributed a lot of design to it, but I, it was not my baby to start with. And because of that, uh, I was noticed around there, and, and the man that was chief engineer for Ford uh, got hold of Bordenay and said, hey, how about putting this young fellow in charge of this, this e-car project we're talking about? So I was invited over to his office, and I didn't know what was going on. When I came out of there, I was the first one assigned to the what became the Edso project. And uh, I was given the job. The man that uh, told me about it told me that you are going to head up a small team that will start now, and within the next three years, we are going to produce a car that will be between the Ford and the Mercury, a medium-sized car. And it's got to be different. It cannot be like anything on the road. So you've got a clean slate. Now, there aren't many car designers that get a clean slate with a multi-million dollar company behind you to say, go ahead and have fun. So I picked out four fellows to, to be my nucleus of team that I worked with, and they gave us a room that is about, uh, I'd say from the end of the platform to that wall, that square, for the four of us to work in. This was our studio. The normal studio at the Ford Design Center is 90 feet wide and I think about 160 feet long. Ours would have fit into one of the offices in the corner. 
And we took a lot of razzing because we were in a little room next to the elevator, noisier than hell, and uh, cooped up in this closet as we were. It was the former library for the design center. And they kidded us because we were, you know, lost children compared to the established studios. But we went about our business of making this baby become a car. The first thing in designing a car is to decide what's it going to look like. If you're going to have a baby, it's got to have a face. And so we sat down, and one of the, the key people in my program was a fellow by the name of Bob Jones, who's now retired. In fact, I think everybody connected with is retired. And uh, he was a nostalgic designer. He loved the old, old cars. And we got to talking about, what the hell are we going to do here? We've got to come up with something. So we looked at all the cars on the road. There were 19 other uh, car models or names on the road at that time. We went out and stood on the corner of one of the streets there and watched them go by. Pretty soon it was obvious. Every car that went by, a block away, you couldn't tell what it was until it got up maybe 60 yards away. Then you could tell it was a Cadillac or a Chevy or a Ford. So we thought, well, there's something missing here. And every one of them had a horizontal front end, something like the very cars today. You know, from the front end, you can hardly tell one apart. A Datsun looks like something else and blah, blah, blah. This was the same thing we ran into. Every car had a horizontal front end with a headlight on the end of the grill. So I thought, OK, the opposite of that is a vertical front end. Now, during my career at General Motors, which was not too long, I was associated in the Cadillac studio with one of the cars that was produced by Cadillac called a LaSalle. The LaSalle had this beautiful vertical nose on it way back then. And it was a classic design. And I know the fellow that designed it. Beautiful. Now, the hell, if they can do a good job, we can do it, too. Let's do the same thing. We'll put in something so old, it'll be new. Now, the vertical radiator and the radiator covers that people used to hang on in front of the radiators, the chrome pileated mesh and so forth, then became a regular part of the car instead of the hung on things that we remember in 19. I don't know, 36, or around there, 38. So we uh, started doing some research into what was a good-looking car with a vertical front end. Now, they had Packards, beautiful Packards. They had Nash's with this vertical theme. They had the LaSalle. And these were all old cars. Most of them weren't even in business at that time. So we did this study. And from that, we said, OK, we're going to go for it. We're going to do a car with a vertical theme and a a minor horizontal theme, I would say. So that was the beginning of the Edsel. Then we worked probably for six months. And uh, during that time, the Edsel division was formed. I think, uh, Gail, you can correct me if any. You know, when you get old, you, three things happen. First, you lose your memory, and I can't think of the other two. <laughs> <clears throat> but, uh, but during that time, the Edsel division was formed. And Mr. Dick Craffey was. Uh, made vice president of that division. Before that, we had no, no daddy at all. We were, you know, an offshoot. And uh, I think even before the Edsel division was formed, we had a show. We had a show every week. But we had a show, big blackboards with all these things that I'm going to show you up on the blackboard of how we are going to do the world's greatest car, post-war car, and uh, what the theme was going to be. And we were enthusiastic, believe you me. We were like babes in the woods. And we did these charts and graphs trying to prove what we already believed. And uh, then we had our first showing. And that was in front of Benson Ford, Henry the Ford's second brother, who was head of uh, that particular group at the time, and a fellow by the name of, uh, of uh, Vic Raviola, who was chief engineer at the time. So I think this was before the division was formed. And I had my first show. Boy, suit coat and tie and all that stuff, and taking the vice president through the whole spiel and everything. And if I must say so, I wasn't a bad salesman. I've got some Irish in me, too. And uh, it all went real well. And they liked what we had, because at least it got your attention. And we said right from the beginning, we are going to do a car that will have what we called road recognition. That was a big key word in, in our vocabulary. And if you couldn't recognize it from a block away, it was the wrong design. Now, there are some designers, and I've known a few of them, that 
they like to hang on a lot of stuff, whether it's on a car, refrigerator, or anything. And there are other designers, and mainly I would put in that class the good Italian designers and the good Japanese designers who believe in simplicity. I believe in simplicity. And I thought to myself, if I can't read that design with one glance, it's a lousy design. So the back end had to be simple enough to be able to read it, absolutely like this, or two fins or whatever. That was before we got off the fins. And we knew we had a good theme when we had this show and everybody went for it. They said, keep going, Let's start the clay model. We haven't even, hadn't even started the clay model. Now our cars were built, uh, I don't know whether any of you are familiar how cars are designed or how they were done, done then. And to a great degree, they're designed the same way now, except for the computer's help that we get. They had what they called an armature, which was four wheels and a very strong steel chassis on that armature we would build a, uh, or I mean on those wheels, we would build what we call an armature, which is a, a bunch of wood nailed together, and on top of that, some of this styrofoam, the industrial styrofoam that you see today, goes on the side of your homes and everything for insulation, and that filled it in to within about a distance of six inches of the so-called surface of the car. Before we would build that model, we would get a, what we call a package from our package engineering department, which would tell us, okay, this car is going to be in this X market, it's going to be a hundred and some odd inches long, wheelbase, it'll be so much overall, it will be a four-passenger car, it will be a two-passenger, it'll be a convertible, and it will be a station wagon. These were our parameters that we had to use. So we would start with the basic car, which was usually the two-door hardtop, and we would put this industrial clay that we use. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar, if any of you have taken pottery classes, with uh, water clay, which you mix with water. It's like mud, you mix it, and as it dries out, uh, it becomes very hard. Now this clay that we use is called an industrial clay, and it's, it's more like butter. If you apply heat to it, it softens it, you can use it. In fact, it gets so hot, you can hardly use it with your hand. But then if you leave it set for a half hour or an hour, it becomes very hard to the, about the consistency of soap a good bar of soap, so you can carve it actually with metal tools and that. And that's really what we did these cars in, full size. We would slap this mud on, great big pieces of it. We had many modelers in our studio, and this was their job, to take the sketches that we made, and from that sketch, put the thing in three dimensions. And that was the sign of a good modeler. If he could look at a sketch and put that model together in a week, then he was a good modeler. And it was hard work, and very good craftsmen these men were. They worked with this soft clay and let it harden, and as it got hard, they would carve at it, chew at it and everything, and finally refine it down to the point where the surface actually had been worked so well that it was as slick as the top of a table. Absolutely that slick. Then one of our men in our shop developed a material that was like wallpaper, only it wasn't. It was mylar at the time. I don't know how many of you are familiar with mylar. Very thin coat of plastic film. And he would take that and we would spray it with, uh, with enamel and with a body color, let's say green or whatever, and in, in long sheets, as long as this table, and we'd take that and lay it on top of the car. And then with, with tools, while it was laying on there, we would wallpaper the car with this. And it actually looked like it was a painted car, like a metal car when we were through. Then when we got to the chrome parts, like the bumpers and the grills and so forth, we would take ordinary aluminum foil, like Reynolds Metal put out, you use in your kitchen. One side shiny, the other side dull. The shiny side would be on the outside, and we would spray the, let's say the bumper with, uh, with a mastic, rubber cement, and then we'd put this stuff on, and with tools, we would smooth this down. When it came out, you swear you're looking at a steel bumper. But we developed this process as we went along. <clears throat> and the Edsel Studio was the first one to do this kind of work, by the way. We never gained any fame from it, but we were the first ones to do it. And I'm going to show you some of the early sketches we made. I really got out of sequence here because we started with sketches. The, the designer artist would sit down and do these crazy sketches, and some of them were really wild. We tried everything. And then from the sketches that these three or four men did, I would select, okay, we'll take part of this, part of this, and part of this. I want to see, we call these renderings. I want to see a rendering of this in three-quarter front view with this on it and this on it and this on it. And this is the way I designed after the thing started to grow. Not by me sitting down and drawing, but maybe by me sketching and giving them direction in that, but also by me selecting. 
and as the studio grew, my job grew, and I eventually be, I had a great big fat title of chief stylist. Today the same job is called director of design, a little fancier, yeah. But, uh, so we would do these sketches, and from those, then we would finalize and we would show, at the end of a week or so of hard work, we'd show all these renderings to the men from the division. They would come over, and I remember Gail used to come with them, and keep them in line, and uh, they would select from there what they liked. Now, normally, we didn't show anything that we didn't like. If we had five designs, we usually had to take the attitude, we're going to stand behind any bloody one they pick. We can't say this is our favorite. If they ask us, we'll tell them which is our favorite. But we've got to be able to stand behind any design we show and be willing to go that way. If Mr. Crappy says, I don't like those, I like this, then we bought what he liked. There were times, of course, when we had the, the opportunity to sort of guide them. Well, to say that, well, we've worked hard on this particular one, but we can see difficulty here. We think this might be the direction. And we would try to tell them what the baby should look like as it was being born or during gestation. So uh, we would have these weekly meetings and lots of nights on Thursday night, we had our meetings on Friday, we'd work all night long getting these bloody cars ready for the show, the showroom. That was part of the, the game of, of uh, designing a car. After we finalized on the car's design and showed them this fancied up model, then we would get what we call sheet metal approval. And that gave us approval on the sheet metal surfaces of the car. This date usually had to be about 21 months before production. Because after that was approved, then they had to take points off of that sheet metal and transfer that into templates and make that into a plaster model and then make that into full-size drawings with many lines on them to make the tools and so forth to produce the tools that would make the car and sheet metal later. During the time that the body surfaces were being developed by the body engineers, we would work on the details. Because when we showed it, we might have had a grill in there that we didn't uh, have proper cooling for it yet from engineers, or the tail lights were wrong, we didn't get enough light out of them there, and it took many months to do that. So we'd do all the refining of that. Then we would also go to work on the interiors. So actually, we handled the exterior first, then the interiors came along maybe a month or two later. All of it finalizing about 21 months before production. Because after that, it was too late to change a damn thing, unless you were a vice president because it just couldn't be done. If it, it could be done, but it was so costly, so much money had gone over down the tube by then, it just wasn't worth it. There were changes made, and I'll show you some of them on some of these slides at the last minute. Very expensive. Because the automotive business is a very, very expensive business. I was in meetings where I saw, you know, they would talk about millions like you and I might talk about a buck or $50 or something like that. It was amazing. But, of course, millions were made after you reached a point where you paid off your tools and then it reached this point, then you made money from then on. And believe me, today, our company, Ford Motor Company, isn't doing bad. More than all three of the others put together, which is, I'm proud of. I'm still a Ford man. Okay, I'd like to start off. If we can turn the lights off, we'll have the first picture. I will uh, preface this by saying to you, we're telling you about a book that I produced because I was so damn proud of this car that I wanted to present to Mr. Henry Ford and some of the key people, Dick Craffey and some of the others, to show them about how we started this car and what we intended to do. We put it together in our studio. It was a handmade book, real nice, and we presented it to Mr. Ford. We called it a prelude to production. This was previous to the time the car was going to go into production. Here was an early one trying to get something that, that wasn't horizontal and wasn't vertical. Now, I mentioned a fellow by the name of Bob Jones, who was my right-hand man. This is one of his sketches. Very good design. Very good art. Whose sketch? Bob Jones, who is, uh, you know, he's, he's not quite as well-known in the Edsel area as I am. But he's a little young. Now, here's another wild ad. I don't know who's that. That man. We took that from the Chevrolet of 19... Around that time, the rear end. Okay, now except for these crazy things, that front end isn't bad at all. Yeah. It's an interesting thing that at the time, 
sorry. At the time we did the the vertical theme, my friend Bill Schmidt, who, he had left the company and gone with Packard, and he had the opportunity to do a show car for the Chicago Art Show or Auto Show, and he did a car called the Predictor, and he took what he knew we were going to do with the Edsel, with just the blade in the front and not the horse collar or anything, just the blade, and put it into a car and put it in the in the uh, show in Chicago. And every designer that he knew really badmouthed him for that. But he had guts. He did it. And it was a darn good car. Very good. I was jealous as hell that he got it in front of the public. But we went ahead with what we were doing. Okay. Now this is, this is a sketch we did for ideally what we would do if we could at the time. A lot of these are idealistic. I think that's another Bob Jones. Some of the early studies. George Barbas is, dis, did this sketch. Yeah. His name is George Barbas. Oh, this is, this is a wild sketch. It just shows you how far we go on things. Yeah. Yeah. There's one of the first models we made, which looks awful. Oh, ugly. <laughs> Ooh, a big earth. What is the, somebody gave me a card yesterday on this. What is the, the Constellation airplane? This reminded me of the Constellation. That's a pack. Like a big goose, yeah. Okay. But that, was, that shows you the problems we had. Okay, here's some of the early sketches. Again, starting, starting to get a little vertical thing. Okay. That's one of our first time out here. Is that where they got Oldsmobile stuck in 11? Yeah. <laughs> Let's not be a smart ass. <laughs> There's one in every crowd. <laughs> Many of this crowd. Okay. Now that's an early study. I'm glad never went any place. Yeah. <laughs> now these are some more sketch studies that I thought you'd be interested. In. And we would have to do these kind of sketches for every detail on the car. And there are hundreds and hundreds of things have to be designed. And while I'm talking about it, one of the things that took the longest to get approval on was a hood ornament. It didn't matter whether it's a Mercury, a Lincoln, a Ford, or what. You could design the whole body and spend a month on it and get approval on sheet metal. And if you, when you got to the, doing the hood ornament, it would take three months to get an approval. <laughs> this is one of the first models that we showed the man. And you can see the beginnings of the scalp here. And no fence. We didn't want any fence. What does the name plate on the fence? I beg your pardon? What does it say on that? Is it Ventura? Oh, no, Ventura. Ventura. We named it in the studio, we named it the Ventura. Oh, yeah. Because the opening in the front reminds us of the Ventura of an airplane. Was that one with the mylar over the face? Yeah, this is, this is all clay. This, this is, uh, see, that's a fake roof on there. This is all clay with, uh, with mylar. Well, your lines were starting to oh, close that. with that. We were actually we were in the Hollywood business of pretending, really. Are those turn signals in the bottom? Are those turn signals in the bottom? What is it? Well, these, these were merely... Uh, uh, road lights at the time, yeah. We hadn't got to the turn signal part, yeah. Now these are these are getting right to the, close to the, the last stage. The, you can see that it was before the dual headlight, but we had pretty well refined this, and we were still working on the side bumpers and the grill. There we are, there we are. Fine yeah. car, This is the code we would put on there, that's 757. So that would be uh, July 1957, before the car came out. This is the car after it was approved, the first one. This is the evolution of a side treatment, some of the first, I think that's one of my renderings, that's a full-size rendering of a car up there on the top. And this is the clay model we developed from it. But that went by the board after a while. Here's a whole series of ideas. One man might do all of these, spend his whole day doing that, and get them knocked down, you know, one after the other. These are very early models. And that, right, the bottom one was really the first try at the scallop, yeah. yeah. And then Pontiac came out with a scallop that had, the similar to the one on the right on the top there, a little later, yeah. When did they decide to go to four headlights? That was a late decision. You know, most of these models were with single headlights. And uh, actually, I, I think it had to do with the engineering of the Ford headlight, I mean the Ford headlight. 
Everybody went at once with them. Yeah, yeah. This is a pretty finalized form of the car. How is the decision made to have it built on both the Ford chassis and the Mercury chassis? Well, the first decision was going to be the car between the Ford and the and the uh, Mercury, a small car, another s slot in the marketplace, as we call it. And then uh, everybody started to get growing pains in that, and hey, let's make this bigger than what we started with. And so they all got together and sold the top management, and hey, we need another one. And so we really went for broke and did the one between the, the Mercury and the Lincoln. We really bit off more than we could chew at the time, right, Gail? But we chewed like hell. Yeah. And of course, you're familiar with this. This is the one that was approved. Okay, we. This is. It looks like we're beginning on the rear end theme. I don't know. Oh, here are some of the sketches we made for the uh, front and rear end. This just shows you the kind of quick sketches we would make that I might select a theme from. Now, this this shows you from sketch to a model. Here is the demonstration. This is sketch designer this front end to get a model. That's the '59. Now, this, no, the 59 was done with the three taillights, but this was not for 59. Is that clay or is that that? Those are clay. That's clay. That's the same one you saw before. That's clay. And you can see there, that's a solid uh, greenhouse at the time, too. That looks like the mercury taillights. From, uh, I don't know. I think we might have stolen them from a Chrysler put in there. We would, we would steal stuff from all over, just put it together and make up something, see what happens. <laughs> Honestly, we, it was an experimental business, and we did this to get reactions from people. So we would do all these sketches and models. Yeah. Now this just shows uh, how we went from that sketch to that car on the right. This is out in the courtyard at the design center at Dearborn. This is July 1955. That was very early days. You can see the name Ventura, by the way. There's a real old one. We had some pretty ugly ones, too. Who came up with the uh, hubcaps? I beg your pardon? The hubcaps? What about it? Who, who was that? Would that, uh, would that have been in the artist? Well, I, I actually think the guy that designed the hubcap with the spinner in the center and everything was Bob Jones. Now, there's the 58 with a matching rear end with those uh, oval uh, thing in the bumpers that you saw. Is that a clay model? That's a clay model. Oh, yeah. All of these are clay models. This is now we're in the instrument family, in the interior business. Oh, this is where we were studying with REACH, REACH studies on instrumentation and uh, anything to do with the car. This was a study of, as far as the crash pad is concerned, how much we had to come up into the air to protect uh, the swing of the body and so forth. So we were studying the deep dish steering wheel and this this kind of stuff long before it was used anyplace else. Yeah. This is this is the beginnings of the instrument panel, and there again is the sketch, and there is the clay model. Now a lot of people have commented on the the speedometer of the Edsel, and I've got to take credit for it. I was sitting in a okay. I was sitting in an old Model T and it had the, the floating uh, gas gauge in it. It was floating like this, and the needle, you know, you watch the needle go this way on it. And I thought, what the hell? Suppose we turn it sideways, and we can, all we're doing is demonstrating something from empty to full, or whatever you want to call it, from zero to 60. Why don't we do it that way? And the first time we showed it, everybody was very excited about it, except the engineers. How the hell are we going to do it? And they finally, they finally worked it out, and they did a marvelous job. And I think it's one of the unique speedometers in the last 30 years. I don't think there's ever been another one like it. Yeah. This is how we started to develop the shape of the instrument panel, with the, all the instruments right in front of the driver. We did some of the earliest studies of what is called ergonomics, which is reaching for here and reaching for there, what you can reach and what you can't, which have become part of the design business in automobiles, the same as in airplanes. No use getting in a car if you can't reach the pedals. No use getting in the car if you can't reach the ignition key quickly or whatever you need to do. So we started making studies on this at this stage. This is a, this is a further development in which the, the pod, the instrument panel pod, is now a rectangular. It's one of those ones that we showed in the beginnings of this crash pad.
Oh, and there's, I think that's the first time we showed the buttons on the center. Whose idea was that? I'll take that I'll one, take too. Oh, yeah. yeah, I've got that. No, I've got that. Now, we were not the first car to have push buttons, you know, electric shift or whatever you want to call it. I think, uh, was it the Packard or Studebaker? Oh, and Chrysler, Chrysler also had it over here on the left-hand side. Packard was the only electric one. Right, but Cord had it before that. Cord had an electric one down here, yeah. But the idea of this was I loved the, the push buttons that were on the other cars, but I didn't, I didn't want to put them in the same place. So I thought, hey, besides that, you've got to take your eyes off the road to use them. You could run into somebody. So why don't we put them right where they're right there, and you could actually do them and look with peripheral vision and see what you're doing. That's why we put them in there. That was another screamer as far as the engineers were concerned. <laughs> They, and the mechanic, really, they thought, you guys are crazy. You know. They never did figure that one out either, did they? Yes, they did. I was just told today there's no trouble if you follow some particular rules now on it. Oh, but they did have headaches with it, believe me. I know it, yeah. But that's, that's part of adventure. But it, it, uh, it is something everybody remembers about the car now. And I don't think there's an engineer in the Ford Motor Company who doesn't remember me as the guy that said, hey, let's do this. But I didn't make the decision. By that time, it was the division made the decision to go ahead with it. Here's another version of the instrument cluster. So we would try many. For what you see as a final version of the 58 Edsel, we might have done 10 to 50 different designs to get one part. Well, I don't care whether it's a steering wheel or... Beg your pardon? Six buttons. Six buttons. Yeah. Yeah. Now, here we are practically at the finished version. Yeah. Yes? What's that on the left side of the instrument panel dash pad? Now, I, I looked at it, and I'm trying to remember. I'm not sure whether it had something to do with the windshield wiper or something, but with the levers moved this way. Electric seats? Electric what? No, it could have been a seat control. That I don't know. Seat no, seat Cadillac controls are here. Right seat controls are right here. Cadillac used a windshield washer up there back in the I honestly have forgotten what that was. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's the third thing that happens. <laughs> Now this was a study we made for the at the time of designing the steering wheel. Now this was just a dummy steering wheel with dummy buttons there to show the idea. Then we went from that to the final life version. Question? Yes, yeah, above the, next to the courtesy light, there's two round switches. Oh yeah. yeah. Those were you know well we would yeah. during the process of designing the instrument panel we would move instruments or or uh, dials or buttons or all over the place just to try them out. Yeah. Now there's one where we took the pod and wrapped it around the side with the some of the uh, window buttons on the left hand side. That one doesn't have the back of there. Now there's where we separated the the speedometer from the rest of the cluster. We tried that. Here's a close up. That's a close up. Now this is all fake. There isn't there's hardly a piece of metal in what you're looking at. That's clay too. All of all of these parts are clay. This would have been made in the shop on a lathe, you know, in aluminum. And those craftsmen down there, they could do anything in metal for you. They were marvelous. Yeah. But we used to have to warn the, warn the members of management, Mr. Ford, Mr. Breach, any one of them, don't touch that steering wheel when you sit in the car, or don't move that lever. They're liable to grab the gear shift, and yeah, but whoop, come right off in their hand. Honestly. Or they walk up to the car and grab the, the door handle and pull it right off the model. <laughs> this happened lots of times. Well, they weren't used to it, and we were, you know. Now, there's, uh, it's not a very good photograph, but that shows the finished instrument panel as it was approved. Yeah. Now, there's the finalized steering wheel. Yeah. Now, this was the beginning of the idea of the one-third, two-third front seat. I won't take credit for that because I don't know who did it, but... But it was a good idea because it allowed you on a two-door to get into the back seat very easily because, you know, it really opened it up. And everybody went for it, liked it very much. And it separated the driver from the other two passengers in the front. And nobody had to sit on the center crack of the seat. They liked it so much they put it in the four-door, too. <laughs> That's production, yeah. There's a clay model. We usually did clay models of the seats in that to show the contours. And from those, the engineers, the trim engineers would study the best way to put the covers on and how much padding and so forth. Yeah. Those are the uh, mock-ups that we would make to, to sell our trims in that, in different series. 
Now this is the interior, the start of the interior. Some of the early sketches, these are Renrigs. This is part of a, a, a design board that we put up to show some of the things we did. These are renderings of the interiors. We use those to sell the division trim styles so that they could have different trim from one car series to another, from Ranger and Pacer up to Citation and so forth. Some more renderings. It took as long to do the interior of the car as it did the outside. There's a whole batch of them. That sketch was done in 56. Now there's a fiberglass model. That's the 59. Okay, there's where we were playing with some, some new uh, side view themes for the 1959. I, I like that side theme. It seemed to work out pretty well, but we couldn't sell it. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, this is this is the first shot to show the inside of a studio. This is what our studios were like, the big rooms. And what you see there, that structure, is what we call a bridge. That was a measuring device. And on each side were the, these rails, and that device would slide along there, and you, you would take a ruler, a piece of steel about this long with a point of it, and all measured off, and they'd push in beyond a certain point, and then the engineer would take that point, and then they'd move up an inch and go in a little more, move up an inch, go in a little more, and then come down the same way from the crossbar, and you get all the points, and that's the way you made your cross-section drawings for the cars, for the engineers, to make the sheet metal. There's a 59. That's another side treatment we tried. Now, that was still on the big Mercury body then. Yeah, that was the big car, yeah. Again, fooling with the 59, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's half and half, yeah. yeah. Right. There's another one of those tape drawings. Yeah. I think what I've shown you here is we did a lot of lousy stuff, but we also did some good stuff that never got by. Well, this is interesting. I've got to point this out to you. We had a man join our company at the bequest of uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Breach, and his name was, uh, he was with Packard. Nance. 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 John Nance. He joined our company, and he came in with the blessings of Mr. Breach, and boy, he was going to be a big hero. And he was put in charge of the Edsel design and that. And his taste was in his left eardrum to start with. <laughs> but we had already designed the tail lights on this car. And they were actually all red. That was all red. With a section of it in white. And it looked very nice. All one lens. Something like the 58, you know. And he didn't like that. He wanted circular tail lights because that was a Ford trademark. And he decided he wanted... And I put those in. I remember, I hadn't learned then, I, I started to argue with him about it, and then I realized he had bigger guns than me. And he said, that's the way it's going to be. I said, yes, sir. And I must uh, add a little to that, because we did it, and I don't like those taillights, personally. They're not the way they should be. They should be one lens. Anyway, now there's another taillight study. Now here you can see the problem. The problem we ran into with this, running into this. But it made a pretty good workout. Yeah. We couldn't sell that to Mr. Nance either. I loved him. <laughs> Next. There's that, there's that side treatment. And, okay, part of this, the side treatment that we ended up with on the 59, which the back end of it was very similar to this, you know, changed up there. One of the reasons why I objected to the the three, three circles on the tail light was the meeting point of this with the tail light. And Mr. Nance insisted that we not change this. So, yeah. Now, those are the 59 tail lights that I was telling you that should have been on the car. Yeah. If I had a 59, I would have lenses made up like that. <laughs> there they are. There they are. I'm glad you agree. You're better designers than they were. Here's a wild one. Another way that we studied these designs uh, to just say, do we like it or don't we? We developed a method of doing a drawing with very thin tape. It is now called drafting tape. 
and it was because of our need for it that it became something that's used all the time now. And you can buy it in any drafting store or art store. It's an eighth of an inch wide to a quarter of an inch wide. And you take a piece of black stuff like that and put it on white paper, and you can make a line that fast if you're good at it. And we used to do these real quick studies, and that's all in tape with some chalk on a, on a white piece of paper. And we might do 10 of these and show them on a Friday show, say, okay, four of these we like, the rest of them we don't, we knock them out. And we'd go from that to maybe a full-size rendering and then to the clay model. These are all steps to get approval. Yeah. Our own approval or somebody else's. Yeah. Next. Okay, that's the beginning of what we thought was going to be the 1960 Edsel. You can still see some of the 59, the, the headlights are very close to that, yeah, and the fenders. Was that the 60 or the 59? Take your pardon? 1960. The 59, of course, uh, well, we know what the 59 looked like. This was an evolution of the 59 into the 60. Now, we would make many studies. How much do you change? Do you cho change the center? Do you leave the fenders alone? Do you change above the joint, below the joint, to, you know, whether it was a massive uh, uh, makeover or a minor one, depending on how much money they want to spend. This was about the time when we started to get the bad news about, hey, things aren't so good, you know. <laughs> Go ahead. There you can see the vertical radiator theme, the Edsel theme a little bit, yeah. And we were fooling with different grill patterns. That wasn't too bad a front end either. Now, this is really very close to the car that, as far as I was concerned, was going to be the 1960 Edsel. It was right after this that I went to England. <laughs> yeah. But it looked pretty good. It was a pretty exciting car. Yeah. To me, that's the way the 60 Edsel should have looked. Now, what actually happened was that when the bad news came around, everybody was trying to save their neck, and they said, okay, we'll pick up the forged sheet metal, and we will just change some of the ornamentation. And a very good friend of mine, his name is Bud Kaufman, he's one of my best friends of my life, and I see him two or three times a year, and I go visit him up in Michigan and in Florida, and he says, be sure and tell those people that I did the 1960, Roy, after you left. And he did. He did. He did the one with the, what I call the bananas on the back, the vertical bananas in there. And his name is Bud Kaufman. He's an excellent watercolor artist now and so wins a lot of prizes and does a lot of painting. Okay, these are advertising uh, shots. I think these came from Smith Conan Building. Yeah. Go ahead. These were shots that were taken at the proving ground. That is one of the most outstanding colors on a big 50. Fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Now, I'm sure you guys or, or you, you folks have read about or seen maybe the shots of the cars when, on opening day at the test track when they came up and <laughs> went along on one wheel and scared the hell out of everybody. And Dick Crappy nearly died. And this is the guy that was, really put the whole show on. And or Emma, Emma Judge, really. Yeah. And uh, there were a lot of people who were quite critical. What are you trying to do? Risk everybody's neck. That could have come into the crowd. But boy, did we get everybody's attention. That's the 25 million Ford V8. This one? That's the 25 million Ford V8 that was built at the Lima, the Ohio engine plant. Yeah, oh. that's what that picture was. Is that right? No, no, I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Coral and white, yeah. yeah. Not a bad looking car. Beautiful car, right? Is that's that it? Right? Okay, I wanted to tell you a little story when I talked about Mr. Nance and I was arguing with him and so forth. And I've always been frustrated as a designer when someone would come in and start being the designer. It's like hiring an architect and then you tell them how to do the house. And that's the most frustrating thing for a designer. You want to hand them the tool and say, okay, you design it yourself, damn it, and walk away. But then you're out of work. And I've always compared that with the idea of uh, the administrative manager of a hospital going up to the surgeon and saying, now, wait a minute, I think we ought to cut here. <laughs> you know, the surgeon would say, up oh, your left eardrum and goodbye. <laughs> well, when I went to England to 
the, their chief designer. The man that was head of the company was Sir Patrick Hennessy. Terrific big guy, six foot three Irishman. Wonderful dynamic guy. I was there a week and he came, he loved styling. He loved to come around and talk styling. I was there a week and I was this new guy on the team, you know. And he came in and he said, well, young man, there's what kind of cars are you going to be doing for us over here? And I said, well, Sir Patrick, uh, I'm going to, he says, are you going to do cars that please me? I said, I'm not sure. I said, you know, I know damn well I'm going to do cars that please me. If they please you, then you've got the right designer. If they don't, then I'm going back to America. He says, I like to hear of that. He says, he says, I never believed that you should buy a dog and bark yourself. <laughs> I, I, have never forgotten, I, I have never forgotten that saying, and I've used it many times just as a, a point to make that if you're going to hire the dentist, don't hold the drill, you know, <laughs> or whatever. If you hire a pro, let him do it. Tell him what you want, and you've got to do that. But if he tells you, look, you can't have it, get another guy, then okay. But don't buy a dog and bark yourself. And I thought it was mine. Okay, everybody takes a break, right? I'm now going to turn the program over to Gail Warnock who was the Public Relations Director for the Edsel Division between 1956 and late 1957. And he's going to speak, and then when he's finished, we're going to have a question and answer session from anybody that has any questions regarding the Edsel, and we'll try to get them to the proper authority. Here's Gail Warnock. Now, I'm going to demonstrate how you're supposed to use this thing. You <laughs> Uh, I, I really don't have very much to say. I, I learned a lot tonight, uh, a couple of things I didn't know, but I, I do want to respond to a couple of questions from the audience, not questions, but statements from the audience. Uh, the the one-third, two-third seat that was in the uh, four-door as well as the two-door was a deliberate, uh, it was not something that we didn't know what we were doing, You've got to remember that 30 years ago, a six-passenger car was a six-passenger car. That's number one. And it was easier, short of a bench seat, to, to have this kind of a seat. Uh, but, but even more importantly, one of the selling points of the Edsel at that time was that the driver is king and he had his own seat. And so we gave it to him. It didn't make any difference what kind of a car. So that answers one question. Another question was, who's the girl? And the black-haired girl was my secretary, and who posed for many of those, those pictures because she was the prettiest girl, and obviously, or she wouldn't have been working for me. <laughs> and by the way, my wife's out here, and she hears every word of it, so. Is she the one that said it's almost like being in love? Yeah, almost like being. Everybody loves that. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, and I have another little story that you've never heard. And those of you who've read the book, I, I, there's hardly anything I can tell you, but I can tell you uh, an interesting little story that happened after the book was printed. Shortly after the book was printed, I got a tele or, uh, cablegram from Australia uh, from a, um, uh, a bookstore saying they wanted me to send them a case of books. A case of books are 32. 32 books. On the case of books, and they wanted me to send them airmail. And I wired them back, and I said, books cost you more by airmail than books cost, you know, trying to get it in 10 words. And uh, uh, got another wire back, and he said, send them anyway. And I wired them, and I said, send money. Because we, we were talking about quite a bit of money, and I wasn't about to send them down there and not get the money at all for it. I never could figure out why somebody in Australia wanted 32 books. But finally, after two or three years, it came to me. The, uh, the assistant managing director of Ford in Australia was Edsel Ford. And of course, the bookseller figured that I was, was writing an expose on young Edsel, the Edsel <laughs> Affair. <You know? laughs> I, uh, 
uh, I never got another order from the guy. I imagine he's still eating them down there. <laughs> I, uh, I don't really think that uh, I'm going to talk much longer because I really don't have anything to tell you that uh, you haven't already read in the book or read someplace else. Uh, so if you'll take this and uh, take... Thank you very much, Gail. Thank you very much. We're going to proceed now with a question and answer session, which is probably going to be one of the highlights of this meet. Roy? Would you come up here with Gail and have a seat? There's a lot of people that have a lot of questions about a lot of things to do with the Edsel. We're going to tap these two gentlemen for their knowledge and their expertise with what they know about the car. And any assistance that I might be able to give, so much the better. Rick, uh, you have I'll, one question. Yeah, I'll leave things off here and ask right now. What did your rivals think, like GM, did you hear any, any uh, when the car first came out, Roy, what were the other stylists' opinion uh, from the other club? I mean, the other companies like Chrysler and uh, GM. Did you hear any grumblings about uh, what they thought of the design when it first came out? I think they were favorable, yeah. as I remember, and I knew most of the. Des I didn't know all the designers at GM at the time, but I knew nearly all the designers at Chrysler, and uh, I think, as I remember, they were very favorable. If you studied the styling of the 1959 cars, you can see that the Edsel had a powerful influence over the styling of 1959 cars. And uh, you can say that Ford made a terrible mistake by coming out with a car that looked the way the Edsel did and sold the way the Edsel did. But when you feel, when you realize the way that General Motors and the other Ford divisions and some of the independents patterned their cars after the Edsel styling, it's not hard to realize that Ford was not the only one who made a mistake. Entire Detroit was put on notice that they were in for one hell of a battle which they thought they were, and their styling proved it. Questions? Right here in front, Gary. Yeah, Larry, uh, when did you get the word from Ford that they were going to discontinue the Edsel? Question was, when did Roy Not me. or Gail? He, I think he knows it. Gail. When did Gail get the word from Ford that the Edsel was to be discontinued? I was not with the company uh, when, and you were in England, weren't you? Uh, when they, uh, yeah, when they uh, 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 decided to uh, to kill off the Edsel, uh, but I believe the date was a, I think it was November the 19th was the date, and I got a telegram from my former boss Ted Mackey, and uh, I I can't remember what the words were, but it uh, it was something to the effect that the Edsel was dead. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and that was the first that I knew. But of course, we, we knew anybody that was in the business or out of the business uh, knew that uh, it, was, it was straggling and struggling. And, and of course, Mr. McNamara was trying to kill it and, uh, and succeeded. They must have uh, made that decision at the boardroom a lot sooner than November 19th, though, right? Oh, yes. It would have had to have been made earlier than that, but the announcement was made uh, I got the telegram about 12 hours before it was in the newspaper. You know, it was no big scoop. Uh, yes, that's right. There were many things made in the boardroom that, uh, that didn't get out until uh, much later. And, uh, and unfortunately, one of them was made and got out too soon. Question over here from Edsel. Larry, uh, my understanding is that when the 58 Edsel hit the, hit the floor, that the 59 was already sewed up, locked up, with no push buttons. This is when true. When did they discover they made that big mistake with the push buttons, or it wasn't, was it a mistake? When was it discovered that the 58 push buttons was a mistake which was deleted that option from the 1959 models? Can either of you gentlemen answer that question? I don't think, I don't think it was a mistake, it was deleted. Yeah, we were cutting. It was an expense, it was a, it was a cost cutting effect, and the 1959 push buttons were, well, here, I'll let, I'll let Roy. I'd like to add a little comment there, just as a designer. Part of the reason why the push buttons were done, again, was lo looking for a new way to do something. And we picked up, as I said, from the Packard and so forth. But after, the, after we had the push buttons in the car, I was looking at it one day, and I thought, what the hell? Supposing we all had push buttons, what's the first thing you'd do? The first thing you'd do would, would have been the column shift as something simple, much simpler and cheaper because it was simpler and cheaper. 
we just did it the opposite way. We, did, we went expensive and then we came back to being cheaper. Yeah. Yes, sir, right over here. Uh, question for Mr. Warnock. For how, Mr. Warnock. How long did the sweetheart period with the short lead press last? And then the long lead press, like the buff books, did they stay relatively friendly to Edsel as a, an entity, or did they start to gang up the way the uh, daily press did? The question was, how long did the love affair between the Edsel division and the press last before it turned to an animosity program? Gail? The long lead was always favorable. Uh, remained, you know, even after the car went out, we got stories about looking back on the Edsalons. You, you remember those stories. The, uh, the daily press and, and the media, the TVs and the rest of them, uh, were our friends uh, up until they found out that the public wasn't buying it. But up, up, up until then, in fact, they had, they had uh, uh, carried the, the Edsalons, you know, I, I wanted to, for example, you remember Roy was talking about the uh, the one thing that everybody got his hand on was was the the Edsel design on the radiator, on the hood. Uh, I the first time I ever put out anything that had anything to do with the Edsel was that radiator ornament, and it it was printed in I don't know how many hundreds of newspapers because they were so darned anxious to print anything they could about Edsel. They just didn't know anything about it. And as I said before, you all remember the, the cover of Newsweek magazine, uh, which showed nothing more than a wheel and, a, and, a, and the, uh, uh, no, not the hood ornament, the, the, just the wheel. That's all, no. it, that's all it showed. Uh, that picture was given to Newsweek, but uh, uh, what, what I had given them originally was a bunch of people standing around in Edsel so you couldn't see it. And then just for fun, I gave them the one with the with the wheel, and that was the one they used in full color. I mean, it made absolutely no sense, but the media really loved us up until, which was about six weeks after the car was introduced. Then we began to get nasty little digs about the car, and the, you know, the uh, uh, Oldsmobile sucking a lemon and all that sort of thing. By the way, I want, one other thing I want, before I forget, I wanted to, wanted to point out that the so-called horse collar appeared a little just three years later I think it was on the Pontiac and BMW likes it so well they run two of them you know they have if you think the Edsel's ugly look at a BMW it's one of the ugliest cars in the world uh, the what oh Alfa Romeo is so bad it doesn't even warrant discussion uh, I'd like to know when either one of our illustrious persons there heard of the three time loser of <laughs> Okay, does either one of you know the three-time loser? Yeah. Yeah, Edsel Ford's going to give you $10 if you can give him the right answer to the three-time loser question. Uh, I, I think it's a prostitute driving an Edsel wearing a Nixon button. <laughs> <laughs> Came out a pregnant nun driving an Edsel. Oh, well, <laughs> it's a pregnant nun with an Edsel and a Nixon bumper sticker. Okay, there's a question over here. Smyrak. Yeah. Uh, yes, on the Edsel show, how was it thought out that they would uh, produce the show and how much they would expand it? Well, let's behind the show. On the Frank Sinatra Bing Crosby show, how did they arrive at the decision to use Frank Sinatra and Bing Crosby, and then how much did they spend producing that program? Gail? Well, you know, there are so many dollars thrown around anymore that I get a little confused on what these things cost. Uh, whatever it was, and, and I really am not, I'm really not sure, I think it was $50,000 that we paid uh, Bing Crosby. It was his first television show, and he wasn't too sure that he was going to be a hit anyway. He'd been on radio a lot. Uh, his $50,000, however, went to Gonzaga University, where he went to school. So he paid, got paid nothing. But in return for that $50,000, he said he would put on a show. Now, Bing Crosby got the entire group for nothing. He, he, I was, I was, with him when he asked Frank Sinatra to appear on his show and it was a handshake and Frank said I'll get even with you and, and it wasn't long after that show until he Bing was on uh, 
uh, Sinatra show. Of course, Bing's girl singer, Rosemary Clooney, had uh, had been with him on radio for a long time, and she did. She was very much in love with. I don't mean in love. She liked him very much, and she would do anything he asked her to do, and so he asked her to be on the show. The the only other money that we paid out was that anybody really got any money was Bing Crosby's son, uh, Lindsay. Lindsay. Uh, and uh, Bing said uh, he'd like to have his son on the show. And uh, uh, said, well, uh, what's he do? Well, he, he sings, he's got a little group he sings with. And uh, he said, okay, uh, how much is that going to cost? And Bing said, oh, I'll give him 5000 I remember that very distinctly, and I also remember the show because, I mean, I remember Lindsay singing uh, uh, something on an island. In the middle of an island was the name of the song, and, and it died quickly, and it was just as well because he didn't do anything to make it laugh. <laughs> he couldn't sing. Uh, the, uh, to the answer to the other question, I, the uh, promotion was whatever was in our budget. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't remember. Uh, we didn't. Uh, we had 250 million dollars to spend, and we spent 249 million. And, and Dick Craffy was just absolutely tickled to death, and we came in a million under. Uh, now that's no money at all because we now spend that on just uh, cobbling up a new car. Rick, I got two questions for Roy. Okay, two Number questions for Roy. One, we know uh, Gail's reaction when we heard the car name. The, the car was going to be named Edsel. I'd like to know Roy's reaction of when he first heard that the car was going to be called Edsel. And the other part is, I'd like Roy to comment on what was his favorite 58 model. Question is, what was Roy's reaction when he discovered that the car was going to be named Edsel? And then what is Roy's favorite 58 model? Here's Roy. I had a, I had a negative reaction to the word, because I don't think it was a phonetic word. But then at the time I remembered thinking, hell, supposing somebody called something Buick. What a lousy name. And that's true. Any name like that, it's only after it's used a long time that we get used to it, no matter what it is. And, uh, you know, Edsel could have been Buick inside out. Doesn't matter, really. What was the other question? Your favorite, What's your favorite model? model? 58 patient. Yeah. Why? The proportions of the car off the Ford body were better. And we did that first, of course. And then when we got the big Mercury body with that that door section with the, the log along there. Boy, that made it a tough job. <laughs> and I think that's really why I don't particularly like the other. It's, a, it's all right, but it's a big boxy car compared to the little one. Yeah. Question in the back. Uh, where did they come up with the names for the cars? Where did they come up with the names for the cars? Gail, can you answer that? Yeah. Oh, boy. The Citation, Pacer, Corsair, and uh, Ranger were the four top picks in all the surveys that were made around the country. They were made at, mostly at airports, and uh, they were asked, of this list of names, which, which do you like the best? Or which one do you like the best? And the Citation, the, the, the winner was exactly the prices of the cars. The Citation was first, the Corsair was second, the Pacer was the Jet Ranger was third, and the Pacer was fourth. And uh, pardon? Pacer was third. And third and Ranger was fourth. Right. Okay. And uh, uh, <coughs> for as 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 far as anybody at Edsel knew, and I think Roy will back me on this, we thought that one of those four would be the name of the car, and it wasn't until Mr. Breach. Uh, uh, pulled the same thing that Nance pulled on Roy, uh, that we found out it was going to be called Edsel. And this was after Benson Ford told me that when the rumor got out that they might call it Edsel, because we'd been calling it E for experimental. Nobody was paying any attention to Roy's Ventura, which was a great name, and nobody was paying any attention to that. Uh, but uh, uh, I lost my train of thought, so I don't know what I was going to say. Uh, let me get over here for a minute. Yes, sir. I have a question for Gail Warnock about uh, Robert McNamara. Question about Robert McNamara. Good subject. Mm, not the most interesting part in his book was the description of the press release meeting with the press in August of 57 when they announced the car. And Robert McNamara, McNamara turns around and says, I'm going to kill that car. 
I'd like to know what the um, what uh, Gail's and maybe uh, Roy's reaction was at that time to what is what I would call sabotage. What would be your gentleman's reaction to McNamara's comment that he's going to sabotage that car made at the press conference in August 1957? Do either of you have a comment on that? Well, with the people we dealt with, you know, at that level, you had a lot of big egos going around, right? And uh, they were like a bunch of favorite sons, the Dukes, you know, working for the king. And boy, they fought amongst each other for power and for prestige and so forth. And so it was a pretty natural remark for McNamara to, to, you know, I'll get the son of a bitch or whatever. Well, I don't know what his remark was. But they, they weren't friendly at all. And Dick Craffy had a tough job because he was sort of an outsider compared to some of the other guys. And uh, he wasn't a games player like they were. He was a very quiet, nice guy, <laughs> I remember. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, comment on that. Uh, I, I did not find out that McNamara said this until I was researching the book. So I wasn't aware of it. But when I found out about it, it made me madder than hell. I don't mind telling you. And that's the reason then that I went back to Ford Motor Company and asked Mr. Ford if I could go through McNamara's files so that I could put in the book some of the things that are in there. Uh, Mr. McNamara was one of my first purchasers of the book. He was extremely excited and wanted to, he was the Department of, or uh, Secretary of Defense then, and he kept, uh, one of his uh, lackeys was calling me every other day wanting to know when the book was going to come out, and I finally asked him why he was so anxious, and he said, Mr. McNamara is afraid that you are going to give him, or uh, say that he was responsible for the Edsel, and I said, no, you can tell Mr. McNamara, I said I've he's going to be responsible for its demise. And he said, well, I want a book just as soon as it's out. And I said, send me the money and I'll send it. <laughs> Perry Piper. I have a comment on the teletouch. Somebody mentioned uh, one of the Japanese people. The dancers. Two years ago, I had several telephone calls from BMW in New Jersey and they paid me 50 bucks for a teletouch assembly out of the 58 Epsom. <laughs> Anything to make the car sell. The BMW is the car that yuppies like today. But yet the, the uh, Edsel was a car that was aimed at the yuppie crowd of the 50s. And you think of the BMW bozos today driving those awful looking things. Would they drive an Edsel? Well, 30 years ago they would have. Edsel. I don't know if y'all enjoy this as much as we are. <laughs> are you enjoying this as much as all of us are? While I've got this, I want to say thank you and let you know how much I, I am honored and enjoy being here and seeing such enthusiasm. And to have a whole room of crazy enthusiasts like you <laughs> is just marvelous. I really enjoyed it and thank you. I'd just like to thank both Gail Warnock and Roy Brown for what they called in the 1958 literature a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. People in, the, in this room tonight will probably live for the rest of their lives remembering this night, being able to talk to people, finding out all these little interesting questions and trivial items about the car that we all love. My only regret is that we don't have another 15 hours to answer, ask all the questions that I'd like to ask. Uh, I'd like to thank both Roy and Gail and Jim Cook for providing the slide and running the slideshow. And thank you both gentlemen for our once in a lifetime opportunity.
A uh, story of a car now. Proof that certain things get better with age it is a story of the most heavily researched product of its time. It turned out to be the biggest flop of its time. Slick back your hair, put on your chinos, get on board. Henry Ford spent $250 million designing it, put his son's name on it, and then proceeded to lose more than he put into it. The Edsel was going to be the car that everybody wanted with a push-button transmission in the middle of the steering wheel. And with a price tag of between $2,400 and $3,700, it was supposed to be music to the ears of the late 50s car buyer. But the Edsel did not sell well at all, and Ford's folly sputtered out after three model years in 1960. Bid on the pair, take one. We have five dollars each. Who'll give me six? Five dollars, give me six. Five, give me six. Who'll give me six? Now the Edsel is the prize of collectors who gather to bid on parts and pay up to $20,000 for a convertible in good condition. Proof that the automotive public forgives and forgets. Like one myself. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow night, everybody. Good night.